There we go. Okay, I see Apple IIe, and we're ready to go. All right, so I wanted to do a very quick video, maybe uh, 10 minutes or so, talking about programming like it's 1981. Um, in particular, a lot of people seem to have questions about how exactly you would have programmed the Apple II back in the day. And I wanted to show you what it looked like before you had tools. Uh, and then I'll show you some of the very basic tools. And then I'll show you, maybe if we have time, uh, what an assembler looks like. So here we've got our Apple IIe running an emulation. Uh, I'm gonna hit the reset button as if we have no, uh, no disk in the drive at all. And here we are, we have no DOS, I can't, look at anything, it doesn't know anything about anything. All we have is the AppleSoft basic interpreter, which was built into the ROM. Okay, so we could write a small basic program just like you'd expect to see. Everyone would write the, uh, the basic program that everyone runs. You know, that's not very interesting. Uh, sooner or later, what everyone did on the Apple II, of course, was play games. Some of those games had bugs. And when the game crashed, you would sometimes drop into basic if it were a basic game. But if it were written in machine language, you might drop to an unfamiliar prompt. And that prompt would look like an asterisk. In fact, it would look like this. Typically, it would beep. And what is this prompt? Well, we can try and get some help. We got a beep. We could type help h. It's just like the VI editor if you're in Unix. Uh, what is this thing? Well, this is the Apple II machine language monitor. So monitor means that you can inspect and change things in memory. So let's try typing a number. Okay, so that is literally the zeroth byte in memory. You could also do that. And we see that it contains the value 4C. Uh, we can inspect other areas of memory. We can go probably up to FFFF, which would be the, probably that would actually be in the ROM memory as opposed to the RAM. Uh, we can inspect um, multiple bytes in memory. By using the dot here, I can say, show me all the memory there. And if you've ever seen a hex dump, you might recognize this. So this is showing us the first row is bytes 0 through 7, and byte 0 contains 4C, byte 1 contains 3C. So, you know, this is cute and all, but what can we actually do with it? Well, we can't just look at memory. So there I'm looking at uh, byte 800, and these all numbers here are hexadecimal, by the way, but we can change them. I could say, well, instead of uh, having 0, I want 800 to have this byte 99. And now if I look at it again, I just change the memory. Um, I'm going to poke a value into byte 640 here. Oh, that didn't work. Let's try this. There we go. Um, up here, uh, actually, let me to use a better value. I'm going to poke value 55 in. All right, now you should see a blinking U up towards the top of the screen. Where did that come from? Well, let's do it again. Let's put that value in the same byte of memory, and there's another U. So what just happened? Well, unlike today's modern machines, which have what's called protected memory, on an 8-bit computer like the Apple II, you have complete access to all the memory in the system, um, which means you can really hose yourself. You could break things quite badly. But most devices would be what's called memory mapped to some region in memory. So the text screen, which is what we're looking at here, um, is actually mapped from, I want to say values from, say, 400 to 7FF, I think, or something like that. Normally, you would look this up if you want to know. When I changed byte 620 to 55, it poked that value, that flashing U is the value 55. If I, let's, if I do 56, 56, now it's a flashing V. If I say, let's do some multiple bytes. Let's do 6, 10, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58. And there you can see the flashing S, T, U, V, W, X. All right, so we can look at memory and we can change memory. 
so what? What's the big deal about that? Well, the monitor actually does some more interesting things. Um, in particular, it can disassemble code. So let's look at memory location 800 again, which is a very common location for programs to begin. And instead of just hitting return here, uh, I'm going to add an L on the end. And now you could see the monitor trying to disassemble um, the bytes that are in code as if they are 6502 machine language. Now, they might not actually be 6502 machine language. They might be data. Um, just as I poked a value into the text, um, maybe this is uh, just some data that happened. You might be able to interpret it as uh, 6502 assembly. But we can actually show this in action. So let's, let's go ahead and write some assembly code in the monitor live. So first, I'm going to go ahead and clear this out. Just throw a bunch of zero zeros in there, which should be interpreted as the instruction break. There's a faster way to do a region of memory, and I'll be honest, it's been 30 years, and I don't quite remember it. So now I can see we got a bunch of breaks here. Um, so what you would do before you had tools, before you had an assembler, is you would get a notebook, and you would probably have a quick reference card listing all of the opcodes of the 6502 instruction set, and you would write your program in assembly language in kind of longhand what you think you would want to do on the left side of the paper. And on the right side of the paper, you would look up the opcode like you were looking up a logarithm with a slide rule. And you would write the opcodes on the right-hand side. There were actually special pads of paper to help you do this because it was so such a common thing to do with 8-bit computers. Um, I'm going to write a useless program right now. That it's just a couple lines of assembly code, doesn't do anything useful. Um, I have some programs that I have prepared for future ones of these, but I don't want to go too long. So let's go. So the one opcode that is burned into my memory is A9, which stands for load the accumulator immediate mode. And you could take a value, let's take 55, and just say that. And now if we look, if we disassemble this code, we can see the top line of the screen there says A955 on the left, and load the accumulator, pound, dollar, hex 55. Load the accumulator with the value 55. Um, let's also then add some more. Uh, let's try, I can't remember if it's 8D or 85. Let's try 8D. 8D. Mm, 4006. I hope that's a valid opcode. I'm not actually using uh, a uh, quick reference card right now, so I'm kind of doing this, kind of surfing here. All right, so we can see that in memory location 802, we have stored the accumulator in memory location 640. So let's go ahead and do some more. We'll load the accumulator with another value. How about, I don't know, uh, 42. And let's go ahead and just continue. We can continue to type memory in here because we're just poking values in memory. And we'll store that in 4106. Um, these are byte swapped because of the endianness of the processor. All right, so now we have our four line assembly language program. Let's make it five lines and just finish it up with a break. And so from the Apple II monitor, you can run the program. So let's go ahead and run the program. Uh, Patrick in the chat says he now sees how I could stand to play things like Space Camp. Yes, exactly. Uh, so we're gonna say G, 800G, go. We just ran our program, it didn't do much useful. When we ran it, we got the status flags. Um, so this is showing us what's in the registers of the 6502. There are three registers. The A is the accumulator, is the one register you could do arithmetic with. X and Y are used for indexing, generally for looping or pointer manipulation. P are the status flags, which are a really complicated topic beyond today's, uh, beyond today's talk. We'll get into that next time if we get there. And S is the stack pointer. And if you could see up here on the line labeled 814, it says 00, zero BRK, BRK, and then a flashing U and a flashing B. Uh, that was the memory we just changed. We just poke those values into that memory, essentially. 
Uh, now, if I were to inspect that memory now, those values wouldn't be there because I poked them into the text field or the text view, the, uh, the text memory map. And of course, here we are changing it so that we could see things. So that's the monitor at its most basic. But we can do a little better. And very quickly, Apple did a little better. Um, they implemented something called the mini assembly. Uh, everyone knows about the monitor because sooner or later you crashed and ended up in it. Um, fewer people know about the mini assembler. So uh, a mini assembler helps you do what we just did, um, but without having to look up the op codes, hopefully. Uh, and you enter the mini assembler. Uh, actually, I think we won't be able to do it here because I didn't load a disk. Oh, well, look at that. It's actually in ROM because this is an Apple IIe. So on an Apple II or Plus, you would have had to load a disk to do this. But here we are, um, and we were able to do it. So let's see what happens here. If we say, great. So in case you missed what happened there, I typed 800 colon and then A999 like that. And it immediately translated it into the opcode and kind of displayed the results for me. Um, so I think if I type a colon, I can keep going. Let's see if that's true. Let's try and store this in memory location 300. Nope, doesn't like that. Hold on. Ah, it's just a space. Okay, so then we're storing that 99 in memory location 300. Let's continue. Let's load value 88. And let's store, let's transfer A to the X register. And then let's store the X register in memory location 301. So not that interesting, you know. Um, I believe we have to hit the reset button to leave the mini assembler. So we'll do that. We'll look at our program. There it is. We'll run our program. First, let's look at memory locations 300 and 301. They contain FF. Let's run our program and let's look at memory locations 300 and 301 again. And you can see they contain 99 and 88. Um, the mini assembler is really just a translator. It's translating completely on the fly. You can type comments. It won't keep them. Uh, there's no file management here. They're just stuff is in and gone forever. So to write a program of any length, of any significant length, if you're not WAS, um, you really need a program, uh, a, a real assembler that will have a, a nice editor, will let you add comments, will have meta things so you could have variables. Um, but but this, is, this is the basics. This is what you got if you bought an Apple in 1978 before there was really any good software for it. Um, this was the type of programming you could do. And this was, a, this was a leap above things like the Kim 1 because you actually had a display on which you could see the output. So that's the basic intro that I wanted to give. Not so much about how to program an assembly language because I think there's tons of resources about that, but just the, the feel of what it was like to try to do these things before tools existed. Uh, if I do another one of these, I think the next step would be to load up an assembler. I would probably use uh, Merlin and show it. Should I do that now or should we, should we save that till next time? You know what? I'm going to go ahead and I'll do it now. I might break the video here for YouTube, um, but just for the people who are watching, I think, let's just stick a disk in here and... Hopefully it will actually work. I don't quite know. I have like eight versions of Merlin here. I'm not sure which one I need. Okay. We're waiting for it to load. I have the emulator set to actual speed of an Apple II, which is hideously slow, uh, of course. Um, so here we are in Merlin. You can see that there's uh, various options here dealing with files. Let's just dive right in and hit E to edit file. We get more or less a line editor. 
I'm going to hit A to add a line. Okay, we can tell it where we want our program to start. Let's make it uh, exactly the same as the one we just did. So we'll say ORG $800. So this is not a 6502 opcode. That's a hint to the assembler. Um, we could also define some symbols. So let's say head is equal to 0300 and tail is equal to 0301. We can have comments. This awesome program writes some values. And then we just write our code as, uh, as we'd like to. The hardest part of doing this um, would actually be uh, using a line editor like this is kind of more annoying than the full screen editors we're all used to today. Um, so I want to store this in memory location 300, so I'll just use the symbolic name I defined. We can do that. I'll say 88. Uh, what did I say? Transfer. Let's transfer it to the Y register this time. Store Y in tail. And then we'll finish up with a break. Okay, not a very interesting program, but I want to stick with uh, doing the same thing in different ways. Okay, I hit return on an empty line here. Uh, and now I can assemble the program. In this case, I happen to know because I read the documentation. Um, the, the lack of online help, by the way, is a consistent feature of early Apple II programs. Uh, you, you simply could not get anything done without the manual. To have the memory, uh, the memory you had in the computer was so limited that to add an online help system to most of these programs, you wouldn't have had room for your program. So let's go ahead and assemble it. I'm answering no to that question. You could see we have a bunch of opcodes up here. It kind of shows us what it looked like. It mentions that we have a few symbols. Um, and then I think we want to quit. So we can now save the source code. Uh, let's just call it uh, test program. Okay, it's gonna save that as testprog.s, S for assembly language. We can then save the object code, which is our actual program that we're going to run. Hopefully this will work. I'm going to quit out of, the, out of Merlin. Let's look at our disk. We have a bunch of stuff here. Of course, I saved it right to the assembler disk, which is not very cool. But let's just really quickly drop into the monitor, make sure that the program is not in memory. You can see it's not. Oops. Bunch of breaks, so memory is empty. And let's run our program. We'll just do brun. We'll run it all at once. What did I call it? Test prog. There we go. Okay, uh, we can see the registers already look correct. Our program did what it was supposed to do, and there it is in memory. So that's the you know that's the the, the long and short of it. This is kind of what the tools looked like in 1978 to 1982, and they got better over time. And you'll see that uh, if you pick up uh, a version versions of Merlin from one of the Apple II disk archives. You can see how they improve over time. They added ProDOS support. Uh, eventually they got a real full screen editor instead of a line editor. But it's it's really a different world. And if I, if I do another one of these, I think the next one will be writing an actual program and trying to, one, explain some of the vagaries of the 6502, um, how programming, even in assembly language, is different on that CPU than on a, let's say, more full-featured CPU. And second, I might try to motivate why would anyone put themselves through this? And the one sentence answer is, man, the Apple II was really, really slow. And so any speed advantage you can get by writing directly in assembly language was, was super valuable. We can go through an example of that next time. That's it. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, it was good. Uh, Good taking this stroll down uh, memory-constrained lane with you. Bye.